Good morning, Brendan. Thank you very much for coming on the Insurance Brokers Podcast. I'm delighted to have you here. Hi, Sarah. Hiya. So, um, lots of uh, really good questions uh, and uh, your thoughts that I'd love to go through. Um, and I think probably a really great place to start is uh, a congratulations on your acquisition of Marks Re. Um, Thank you very much. It just took us two years to get that. I was going to say, COVID hasn't slowed you down. Uh, well, it has in some respects in that it's, it's more difficult, I think, to uh, grow pipelines um, under lockdown. I think we've proved to be a, a very robust business and actually quite efficient with everybody working from home. But my, my one nagging concern is, is that um, generating new pipelines in whatever business that you're in during lockdown has been really d difficult. So I um, have a bee in my bonnet about um, every meeting, whether it's a Zoom or a team meet or whatever it is, starting with a revenue generating item at the moment to make sure that people are reminded that that's, that's got to be our main goal every day. Fabulous. That's a, quite a good uh, way of thinking about it. Obviously, generating pipelines in this, in this uh, circumstance is incredibly difficult. So what other things have you put in place? What are you trying to get your staff to do right filtered through to, you know, developing their own new business pipeline? Sure. Well, an awful, an awful lot of it is um, building the relationship between servicing your client and generating more revenue from your client, not, not being at odds with each other. You know, so I, actually, um, I know in April we generated something like £60,000 of the new revenue in our employee benefits business as a result of cross-selling to our commercial clients. And um, we've, it's always going to be difficult, I think, getting new pipeline in circumstances like this, but we have got tens of thousands of existing clients that we can sell more to, or we can probably serve in a better way. And so we've really focused on that very hard and it's actually been quite successful. We also have, we, we incentivize uh, all our staff for cross-selling we, we we call it cash for collaboration and people can get part of that that revenue that we've generated in the year it's, in the year it first comes to the business um and that's quite popular we, we like writing checks for people when uh, when they've done that successfully um but I, I think it's i think it's more about making sure people stay in touch with their contacts stay in touch with their clients and actually one of the, one of the really helpful things i think using technology like this now has been that um, maybe the idea of having face-to-face -face meetings all the time, driving for two hours, you know, spending all day with one client has gone out the window. You know, clients and ourselves are quite happy now, you know, getting on a call like this for 10 minutes and solving a renewal or sorting out, a, you know, a new business inquiry. Have you, I, I don't know about you, but I found um, people rarely phone me anymore. Whereas I, I, I might pick up the phone to talk to somebody, but it's FaceTime or Zoom. You'll get an email saying, shall we FaceTime or shall we Zoom? Yeah. Rather than just give me a call, which I think is quite nice. It shows the need for that um, social interaction. Yeah, um, I think you, you know, using a phone now is seen as a bit old school, isn't it? Um, I quite like it. <laughs> it depends what you're doing <laughs> at the time, doesn't it? it yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, I couldn't agree more. So uh, building using this time to really solidify the existing relationships you, that you've got it's quite a unique time in terms of being able to do that and having the time and and focus on doing that i think yeah well no, i don't think any of us in our in our lifetimes have had uh, a period like this um and um let's face it you know for for the vast majority of us it's it's been you know, a little sort of uh, tiresome and boring and a bit wearisome really because it's diverted us away from actually what we're put on this planet for which is building our businesses um but yeah i think it has given us all time to reflect on the nature of the relationships we have with our clients the nature of relationships we have with each other how we collaborate with each other uh, i think also how we care for each other um uh, you know a lot of people i think have really struggled uh, being by themselves that we have a lot of single people who, who work for us and i know a lot of them have struggled you know being in a small flat or a studio flat uh, by themselves for very long periods of time and, and they've been desperate to get back into an office situation and, and get some normality back and that's not something I would normally think a lot about but I, I, actually you know we've spent a lot of time thinking through what we can do to help people you know because they are a bit lonely or a bit fed up. And I think you've got the other end of the spectrum there something that I've experienced but seen as well 
is those people that are working full time and, and homeschooling what feels like 5,000 kids at time and the pressures that yeah. that puts on as well. Very, very difficult. I know, um, you know, one of the, uh, one of the people I work with, um, we had a bit of a competition to begin with about what your home office looked like. And I'm, I'm very lucky. I've got a quite a nice home office. Um, and, uh, we have a, we have a very good internet. So we had people, you know, taking videos or, or photographs of their own working environment at home and, and, and sending it in. It was all on the internet. And this lady, uh, dropped me a line and said, this is mine. You know, I've got a kitchen table, uh, three kids sharing one laptop. She's working full time for us as well as homeschooling three kids. Husband works and they're all doing it off the kitchen table. And I mean, compared to what she's had to do, I mean, I've had a dream existence to really have. But we've had people who've been working off an ironing board in the hall. You know, that's been their home office. Um, and I, I think one of the things is that gradually over the last sort of two or three months, people have reconfigured their homes. Um, a little bit to accommodate that you know I know my own son and his wife both work at home and only one can have the office so they've had to reconfigure their, their house a little bit my daughter's been working at home they've had to do the same so um, I, I think most of our homes aren't built for home working and and so to do this longer term we're going to have to reconfigure our, our homes to accommodate more home working I think so you can get the peace and quiet you need I mean hopefully you won't be homeschooling forever but yeah. yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't. Um, I couldn't even begin to think what it would be like to homeschool kids. Mm. Um, it's I not been fun. Probably playing them through a radiator with a gag. I think. Yeah, my uh, my sons watched Jurassic Park on repeat. God okay. knows how many times, and that's to me history. Yeah, <laughs> and that's how I've uh, uh, made peace with myself. Um, yeah. A couple of things you've mentioned there um, that I think are really interesting. This 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 idea that we've had probably since the Industrial Revolution is of work and life being separate. And I feel like this has brought those two together. It's almost a recognition that work and life are part of the same person. And, um, and actually this separation is probably a bit superficial. Maybe we can be a bit more real with it, which opens the door to mental health and all kinds of things. Yeah, I, I can only speak for myself. I mean, my, um, my work life and social life are pretty closely tied together. Um, you know, the, the, most of my, um, most of my good friends, uh, are all in the insurance sector because I've known them for a long time and we've socialized together or worked together. Our partners know each other. Um, you know, so an awful, an awful lot of my social life is with people that I compete against or work with or some combination thereof. And I, I don't necessarily see that much separation. I mean, my, my, my family sometimes are very different from my friends. And, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what to say all, all together about that because I'm the kind of person who, because of what I do as well. I mean, we, we um, you know, we've been trying to grow a business as, as quickly as we can. And we've, we've bought a lot of businesses when we bought 29 so far and I've got a few more to do. Uh, I spend an awful lot of time socializing with the people, the vendors, the sellers and, um, and then some of them become your friends. So it's the, the separation between work and, and home life hasn't really existed for me for a long time. That's interesting. Uh, I'm a bit the same, actually. Work and, and, and life are very, very similar. You throw in homeschooling and it becomes uh, indistinguishable. <laughs> um, just that's a good segue into uh, PIB and the evolution of. I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts on, from, from starting um, five years ago to where you are now and, and what, what processes and thoughts have happened along the way? Um, well, there are, there are a couple of things I think that happened before that, that, um, um, kind of ended up, um, shaping my thinking. Um, um, the first one unusually was I, I got fired. I was the CEO of, of, uh, Willis UK and I got fired, fell out with the chairman and he fired me. And uh, walked across London Bridge to go home that day, and I decided I wasn't going to work for anybody anymore. Um, and that was back in 2011. And then I ended up uh, joining Chris Giles at a business called Giles Insurance, and I ran that for a couple of years, and we sold that to Gallagher. And I didn't really want to go back into um, a, a, a large corporate business. Um, there's nothing wrong with Gallagher. It's a very nice business, and it's got very nice people running it. But I, I didn't think it was for me. And literally within six weeks, I was, I felt myself becoming a terrorist and, um, I thought I should go. So I left. Um, 
And then after that, I, I took a year out before actually I could join PIB. We developed the plans. We started looking for investors. And um, I realized that when we started it, it was, it was going to be big. It wasn't, it wasn't going to be a tiny business. So that wasn't going to satisfy me. And so we looked deliberately for an investor with deep pockets. And we ended up with, with Carlisle. The Carlisle Group, probably the second or third biggest private equity business in the world. They've got over $200 billion of assets around the world. And it's been tremendously helpful to have a brand like Carlisle behind you when your brand doesn't exist and nobody knows who you are. At, at least wearing a Carlisle hat would open a door for me. And that, that definitely, that very definitely worked. The plan was always to have um, quite a diverse mix of businesses focused on, on niches and specialisms, but across a range of retail and wholesale assets. And um, during 2015, um, I wrote a plan and we've delivered on that plan more or less uh, to the penny uh, by the end of 2019. You know, we said to Carlisle, this is how big the business is going to be. This is going to be the shape and size of it. And this will be the financial results in the first three years. And having, having a plan and sticking to it has always been a core part of how I've managed myself, really. Um, I think you have to be driven by something. And, and my drive is always write a plan and then stick to it. So if you say you're going to do something by the end of 2019, you get up in the morning and you say, what am I going to do today that gets me to that plan in 2019? You don't wait till the end of 2019, the last quarter, and start acting on it then. You do it every day. And so starting with the end in mind, is that how you write a plan? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you, you always start with the end game. And I mean, I have a 10 year plan for PIB now. Um, so longer term, but I have a very strong vision of what it's going to look like, um, the kind of business it is, the kind of culture it's going to have. Now, culture is very important. Um, I've worked in large businesses, businesses like RSA and Willis that were hundreds of years old. And your opportunity to affect the culture is limited. Uh, the culture is already set and it's very, very difficult to move it even by one degree. And so one of the things that was really important to us um, when we started in PIB was to have a culture that um, recognized everybody equally. Everybody has a voice. Of course, we pay people differently, but that's according to the, the skills and competences and experiences that they bring. Um, but we very much wanted a business that um, had a low level of hierarchy. Uh, high, high level of entrepreneurialism. We were going to buy businesses run by successful entrepreneurs. And if, if we weren't careful, we'd, we'd, we'd kick the entrepreneurialism out of the people, which we didn't want to do. And our whole goal has been to take the administration, the management and the governance away from um, vendors and leave them be, in a way, to, to look after their clients and to do what they've always been really good at, which is grow their businesses entrepreneurially. What, what got in the way as they grew their businesses was administration and management and HR and regulation and everything. But actually freed up from that, and we take responsibility for that, they, they get back to their core, which is servicing clients. And so that, that, the whole business has been based on freeing people up to go back to what they're really good at, which is focusing on the clients. And so far, it's, so far it's been successful. You know, we've gone from a startup to being probably the, you know, the, the, I was des described as being sort of um, top of the championship. You know, we're not, we're not in the premiership. We're not, we're not going to compete with the Marsh or anyone or whatever. Um, but in, in terms of our, our class, our division of broker, we're, we're top of the league and we didn't exist five years ago. So I think we've done a pretty good job. But we're not finished. You know, we, we want to internationalise the business now. And um, you started uh, this conversation with Mark Sree. Mark Sree is a, is a reinsurance brokerage based in Munich. It's got a very international client base. Its, it's client base is uh, around the Mediterranean, uh, but also in, in Latin, Latin America. It focuses mainly on uh, large uh, infrastructure projects, uh, undersea cable laying, um, uh, wind farm construction and operation in Latin America and so on. Um, and um, we fully intend ex expanding Mark 3 through acquisition and, uh, and recruitment over the next two or three years so that we have a business that probably spans at least two or three continents anyway. That's amazing. And actually, Mark's Re is not a huge company. Is it? It's only five or six strong, I think, I read. So <laughs> I've just been talking to them on a Zoom call like this. It's, it, they're really easy to get hold of because there's only five of them right now. Just 
going back to what you said about entrepreneurialism, a five strong international business is, is pretty something pretty special to have developed that. And obviously you guys are looking for that level of skill set um, and vision, I suppose, is, is, is the way I would describe it. And I'm interested in what you've said about entrepreneurialism and allowing people to get back to that, because I think there's, there's very um, specific mindsets, you, corporate mindset, entrepreneurial mindset, and they don't always mix. And I think there's, a, there's an interesting mix of that in the insurance industry, probably more heavier on the, on the corporate than on the entrepreneurialism. From my experience, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I think, I think that's largely true, mainly because an awful lot of us were trained in insurance companies where the balance sheet is the most important thing. Um, you know, it, a lot of people talk about there being an insurance sector. I don't think there is. I think there's the, you know, insurance companies, the provider of product, their balance sheet businesses, and they got the, 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 they get up in the morning worrying about protecting the balance sheet. Um, whereas insurance broking distribution tends to be about people. It tends to be about uh, hiring and retaining really good people who can sell and service to clients. So the, it's it's not a uniform sectors, very, very different goals going on in there. Now, I think from a, a, a lot of people in the sector were trained in insurance companies. Uh, very few people were, were trained solely as insurance brokers. So a lot of the training comes from those big corporates and that big corporate mindset. Um, and that's why I think sometimes the insurance sector can look a bit dull because sometimes it is a bit dull. Um, <laughs> um, but the, the reality is that what we, what we find in, in our business is that you know people break out of that mentality maybe later in the careers um, you know they do the training with an insurance company they they, they go into broking the distribution uh, at some point in their career and then the entrepreneurialism can come through uh, most of the people that I work with um, have worked for an insurance company at some point in the past um, and the training was excellent and they got you know they got all the right skills um, but yeah, broking can be more entrepreneurial, I think. Um, in insurance companies, it's very difficult to make decisions very quickly because of the impact on the balance sheet. You make a decision today about a product or a clause in a policy or, or you launch a new product without fully testing out what, you know, what claims or what liabilities you might incur. Uh, in, a year, in a year's time, you get a slightly different result, but you're never quite sure what lever was pulled to get that different result. So you have many, many levers in an insurance company. In a broker, it's really easy. There's one big lever and it's got revenue on one end and cost on the other end. And what you do is you yank that lever backwards and forwards, you know, more revenue or less cost. Uh, it's, a, it's a really simple business to get a result out of, provided you've got that vision and you've got a strategy and you know what you're doing, and you've got good people, because I'm, 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 I'm saying simple in terms of the, the levers you need to pull it's not necessarily simple to manage because people are difficult to manage but in terms of the the levers that you need to pull it's really straightforward whereas in an insurance company it's you know it's um it's very complicated trying to to make small changes to make sure that you don't then affect your balance sheet in a year or two's time um, yeah one of the things i love about the insurance broking sector is the immediacy you know, this month, even today, we can do something that will improve our result. In an insurance company, it's not so easy to do that. But it's that immediacy which I think um, has given me an enormous buzz about what we're doing. Um, we, we literally can change our result today if we choose to do it. Through your, your career, have you, have you done training or like, you know, you've gone out and sourced, I'm, I, I want to learn how to read a balance sheet properly. I want to um, really understand people management. I want to, you know, whatever the, the, the levers are within a business perspective, do you actually believe in it? Do you do it? How have you got to where you've got? Um, well, actually, I started in, in a small insurance company office in, in Sheffield, straight from school uh, in 1978. Um, and I consider myself very, very lucky because I worked for an organization that trained me, that sponsored me. I had a number of sponsors throughout my career that, that really pushed me quite hard. They, they pushed me sometimes outside the UK, pushed me into, into jobs that I was a little bit uncomfortable about doing at the time. I moved homes, I think, 11 times during that period. Um, and all of those experiences end up making you. So it's a combination of, of some formal training. For sure, I did get a lot of training during that period. 
a lot of sponsorship and, and a lot of um, experience. So I was on an international development program for some years um, where I was given a number of experiences in, in the business, which broadened me out. And I think ultimately made me a general manager. Made, it took me away from, from being uh, you know, a specialist in a department in an insurance company into somebody who could manage businesses. And through that period, then you learn, you know, how I'm not an accountant, but you learn through those experiences how to read a balance sheet or um, how to manage people. Uh, I make lots of mistakes. I mean, you make thousands and thousands and thousands of mistakes over the years. Um, but I think that's how ultimately uh, I benefited from the, the huge investment that, that was made in people over the years. I, I worry these days that that, that investment is not being made in, in as big a way now i mean you know in piv it's only in the last couple of years that we've, we've been able to start making those investments we just weren't big enough and we have a wonderful uh, person now who's our who's our uh, director of learning and development uh claude Beatty. and and claude has made a had a, had a massive impact on um, the development of training and learning and development in piv she's doing a doing a terrific job um so we've, we've, we've been limited so far in what we've been doing, but you can always sponsor people. You can always get older people and give them different experiences. And I think sometimes, you know, pushing and nudging people in, into a different role um, uh, helps them an awful lot. They're, of course, they could be uncomfortable at first until they find a fee, and then all of a sudden they find that they're well suited to this new position and they're, they're maybe a little bit more ambitious the next time around. So I, I think overall, you know, people benefit not just from the formal training, but um, from um, from the sponsorship and just the environment they work in. The the, the thing you talk about reading a balance sheet, um, I, I never got any formal training on that, but I had a deal with the, with one of the with the people I worked with at the time. He was my FD, and there were certain things that he wanted to learn from me, and there were certain things that I wanted to learn from him. So we used to spend a couple of hours every Thursday night doing that swap and. And because he, he could read a balance sheet and see a pattern and I couldn't. So I wanted to learn, how do you see those patterns? How do you see those trends? And I couldn't see it. And so I still can't, I still can't, by the way, but I can, you know, <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm still an idiot, but I can, I, I can now sit there and I'll eventually get it. Um, and, and I gave him something in return. So there are, there are all those kind of things you learn in life later in life that, uh, you don't you don't necessarily need the formal training always, but you do need to go and find somebody that there's a quid pro quo. You can help them; they can help you. I think that's really interesting. I had a I did a podcast with um, Ashwin Mystery last week, maybe it was, and he was also talking about um, sort of self development, continual self development in whichever format it comes. And that there's a there's a certain drive that certain people have to continual continually develop their knowledge and their expand their uh, capabilities and I think I think that's part of what makes an entrepreneur that I'm never satisfied I need to know more there's always something else to go after do, do all your interviewees have the same haircut by the way say that again but do all your interviewees have the same haircut <laughs> I can think of a few that do uh, yes uh, there's a strong I mean, resemblance in haircuts yeah, that's right I mean I think part of what um, I think Ashwin and I are about the same age and I think he's the same. I don't think, I don't think he'll give up anytime soon. Um, you know, I've got friends of mine who are retiring. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of at the retirement age. Um, and uh, I've got no intention of doing that. And I think it's, it's because I still love, look, every day you've got something different, whether it's a different experience with people that you work with or you meet new people or there's a different opportunity. Um, you know, I, 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 I find it still exciting every day. I'm never bored. I think this is going to sound quite insulting, but I think people who want to retire have probably just got bored. Um, and so it's the same old, same old, same old. Whereas I've never found that yet. That I, I think it's different every day. There are different things to do. You know, um, I, I, I know we just bought Mark's Re in, in Germany, um, but, you know, I've got other stuff to do at the moment um, around the world. And I, and I think that's quite exciting. And I, I can see me doing that for at least 10 years. There's 10 years of stuff to do. I had um, a really, uh, one of my first podcasts I did was with um, Peter Cullum and he said something very similar, uh, just never while up. the drive, yeah, the drive's there, go for it. I, I think it's brilliant. Um, just on your, and I can't remember the guy's name, I've been racking my brain. I, it's not Elon Musk, but I thought it was. There is, there is a, somebody out there who's done a thousand year 
business plan. I can't remember his name, but I mean, that's, that's some hell of a drive. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, I have a, a, a plan for 10 years, mainly because, um, uh, well, there's a, there's, a, there's a really good reason why I've got a longer term plan now. One is to show our investors that we, we're not just a flash in the pan, you know, that there is something coming over the next 10 years. And the second one was for, for me and my partner, um, because uh, she spends a lot of time by herself or not with me. And um, it was a case of what, what are we going to do over the next 10 years? How much time are we going to spend together? You know, are you ever going to retire? Uh, uh, so we've, we've worked all that out. Um, and then also for, for other people in the business, particularly Ryan, who's my CFO, but you know, he's, he's, you know, he's like my best buddy and um, he's my partner really at work. And it was important for him to know how, how long he's either going to have to put up with me or can use me. So I, I think there was a really good reason to have a 10 year plan, but I think beyond 10 years, it's very difficult to see what the world's going to be like. And it's also very difficult and I'll be, I'll be quite old then. It's, it's quite difficult to say, well, how much energy am I going to have and, and how motivated am I going to be? And, but, I, but I think it is important to have a plan, you know, that's, that's more than one dimension. It's not just about the business. It should be about, you know, your life, really. And, and then I think, you know, unless you're prepared to share that plan with people, it's, it's really of no use. Every, everybody else around you needs to know what the plan is so they can, they can help you with it. I try really hard to teach that to my kids because you don't get anywhere unless you know where you want to be and how you're going to get there. And, um, and it's, it sounds so simple, but just those having that vision and it might be that your vision, you know, there's so many different types of visions you could have about what your goals are, but to have a goal of any description and then work out how you're going to get there over a period of time is fabulous. And, and, I've, it's my birthday on Wednesday uh, and I've got three years till the big four O and I've yes. just had a conversation with my husband this morning about what the next three years is going to look like and how much he has to save for my 40th yes. uh, and things like that. It's, you know, it's the way forward. Well, I, th I think it's, I mean, I learned this many, many years ago and I, it was, it, I, I was taught this by somebody who was coaching me at the time and I was probably a reluctant coachee. Um, um, but I, I realized that if you, if you have a three-year plan and you have a strong vision of where you want to be, you know, I want to be managing director of a business like this in three years' time. Unless you wake up every day and act on that plan, it's not going to happen. It, it won't happen in, in two years and nine months. It won't miraculously happen unless you act on it every day, you know. And, and for, for many years, and I still do it now, uh, I have, a, I have a, a notebook. It's not in the room with me now. I have a notebook that I write down what I'm going to try and do today, this week, this month. And it's the kind of, you know, what, what skills, competences, experience and networks do you need to have to achieve your goal? It may well be that I need to speak to somebody now, today, to make something happen in three months time, to buy a business in two years time. You know, there's no point putting off that phone call. I need to make the phone call today to make that happen next month and so on. So um, I, I do try and make my plans or give them immediacy, if you like, you know, even if it's a longer term plan, what are you going to do now to make that happen? And, and I think that's, that marks out success in people in a different way. I find a lot of people will have a plan, but it's in a, it becomes dusty and it's in a drawer. And it's, it's, it's really some kind of goal rather than a proper plan. And it's unarticulated. It's just, yeah, I'd really like to be the MD of this business in three years time but I'm not really prepared to do much about it in the meantime. Maybe miraculously people will realize I'm talented and giving me when I'm ready. You know, it doesn't happen like that, does it? You have to work, you have to work at it. And people, you know, people like Peter Cullum, he's a su success for a reason. You know, he's, he never has a day where he's not thinking about how he's going to build his business. He just doesn't have a day off. Um, and uh, I, I, I admire Peter greatly uh, for that. You know, he's, he's created not just one business, but, and he's done it several times. What, um, I, I know COVID uh, period is a, is a blink of an eye in terms of, you know, time, but its yeah. effects are probably going to be quite long lasting. How, how do you manage that in terms of your planning? Have you actively sat down and thought, right, I'm going to shift a bit left here and right a bit here and up and down round? Or what do you... Well, I don't, I don't think it fundamentally changes anything because I think... Um, you know, as every generation brings about some kind of 
change in the workplace and in the work environment, whether it's the technology we use, whether it's our attitude to our careers. You know, when I, when I first started work in 1978, you know, I worked with a lot of people who worked for the same company for 42 years or 45 years. Every, every week there was a party, you know. Herbert done 45 years and they gave him a, you know, a, a gold watch and a cheap bottle of Plonk or whatever. That, that never happens now. Nobody, you know, so that's the, in the space of 40 years, that's changed completely. You know, um, you know, I, I talk to people in their twenties now who think if they've been somewhere three years, it's too long, you know, that they, they should be moving on and getting more experience. So people's attitude to careers has changed. People's attitude to work has definitely changed. I, I think, the, the, biggest, the biggest changes here are they're, they're twofold. One is a really simple one to begin with, which is um, our attitude to real estate. I mean, we're working from our homes now on technology that has existed for quite a long time, but we just didn't get around to using it. So I think we'll use this technology and our attitude to real estate will definitely change. We, we did a survey amongst our staff a couple of weeks ago about how they felt about coming back to work in an office and how ready they were. Um, we, we now know exactly how they feel. We know how they travel to work, whether they drive or public transport, walk, cycle, whatever. So we've got a lot more information about what they do. And I think what we're going to do is go uh, to, this is over, over a couple of years, we're going to go to out of town, business park, office hubs that will become um, more of a social hub than anything else. You know, people will probably work from home two or three days a week. They may be on the road seeing clients two or three days a week, and then maybe one day, two days a week, they might go to the social hub and it will be for team meetings or to socialize with the colleagues or, you know, to meet a client in our environment. Some combination thereof, but I think the traditional working environment where we all sit in rows of desks, and, you know, uh, it's just I think that's, that's going to disappear really quickly now. Um, I think so too. Yeah, the second the second big thing is I think um, I, I think our attitude to each other and uh, one of the things that's often said in the last three months about people in our business is that they're they're collaborating more and we're, we're puzzling over why we we thought we were quite good at collaboration with each other but why is it suddenly enhanced because we're not seeing each other and you know this. This, this environment that we're working in now, the Zoom environment, I think is forcing people to work harder at collaborating and work harder at getting to know their colleagues. And, you know, you can see into my home, I see into your home. It gives, a, it gives another dimension to the relationship that we all have with each other. And, uh, you know, Ryan, I mentioned Ryan earlier on, my CFO. I mean, he's, he's, there's no point ringing him at nine in the morning because the dog's yapping because the postman's arriving, you know. So there are all those things that have deepened the relationship that we've got with each other. That I, think, I don't think you can untie. And I think we've got a more, you know, maybe a stronger emotional bond with each other than we had before. Um, and also we've got that common experience of living through a crisis. I mean, we've all come through this. It's not, you know, for most of us, it's not been so bad. You know, we have unfortunately had a, a member of our team uh, pass on as a, as a consequence of uh, COVID-19. Sorry to hear that. That was, that was a pretty awful thing for, for their family and for their, their immediate team. But for most of us, it has, it's just been an annoyance. So you have to look for the positives. And I, and I actually think we've deepened relationships as a consequence. What do you to... think about the economical fallout of COVID and whether that will have any impact on, you know, long-term business, SMEs, et cetera? Well, it's bound to have an economic effect. If you, if you take away three months revenue from businesses with low, low margins, then... You know, there's there's only two things they can do. They either borrow or they or they go out of business. Uh, so there's going to be an economic effect. I think what what we're seeing is that um, it's everything seems to be coming back fairly quickly, um, apart from the leisure sector. And the leisure sector is going to take a little bit of time. I mean, as we as we speak, the pubs are probably still a month away from opening up. Um, and I think an awful an awful lot of small businesses like those may may struggle to open up, particularly if they're opening up in a model where they can't get back to 100% revenue. So it's gonna be difficult for a while. Um, I think, you know, the economy was, was in reasonable shape beforehand. There's no reason why we can't get back into good GDP growth, I think, in, in 21, 22, maybe slower than, than we, we were, but it will come back. Um, and then I think the, the longer term implication for us all is I think we're all resigned to having to pay more tax because, you know, 
borrowing the billions that we just borrowed to try and keep people employed and to keep businesses going has got to be paid for and we all have a social responsibility to pay for it um, uh, as much as I, I say I mean it, it, I say that some of my friends will laugh because I'm, I'm not famous for enjoying paying tax but <laughs> uh, the, the, the reality is it's uh, we're, it, we're gonna have to pay and it's and it, that's gonna be multi-generational you know we're gonna be paying for this crisis for generations but may, maybe we'll be happier doing it because we realized it was necessary that's just what I was about to say. I think I, I've sort of viewed my sort of vision of COVID is that we've all been stood on the edge of this precipice for, I don't know, the last 10 years. And it's, it's brought about by the, the, the generations coming up. Like you say, three years is too long. It's a very entrepreneurial um, mindset that's coming up. Um, the information, uh, rev uh, information technology revolution, this um, boom in mindfulness, mental health and you know, people trying to push that. You've got veganism. You've got all kinds of, of, of everything coming in. And we've been on this precipice. And I feel like COVID's just swiped us all off the end. And how we land and where we land is going to be a different, a different plane, but interesting in its own right, I think, with a lot of opportunities. Yeah, I think so. I, I mean, certainly for me, what I've seen is that um, the crisis has generated quite a decent pipeline of acquisition opportunities for us. People, people have said, do you know what? I might want to de-risk and take some money off the table right now. I, 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 I was thinking pre-crisis, I might go another two or three years, but uh, not so sure I want to work through another recession and, and better to take some money off the table now than wait. So our, our pipeline's definitely increased, which is you know, clearly an opportunity for us. Um, our business is in good shape. We've had a, a couple of months where anything that was wheels-based, so you know, multi-trade haulage was, was a bit difficult, uh, but that's coming back really quickly. So we've, we've hardly had any revenue here, um, uh, which is, you know, there can't be too many businesses that can say that. Um, plus, we've got some great opportunities. So um, I, I think businesses like ours, insurance brokers generally are fairly lucky because people have to buy what we sell, whether they like it or not. It's a great business. <laughs> Um, have you are you uh do you get time in your incredibly busy life to do much reading is reading something that's um i don't i don't read a lot of books at the moment um i read a, i read a huge amount um but it's it it, it tends not to be sort of novels or anything yeah. like an area have, have you read um charles handy the second curve no it's a book that Peter Cullen told me to read and I'm so glad I did coming into COVID. It's so interesting. It's fascinating about uh, the kind of the, the circular way in which the world and human beings work and, and, and bouncing from curve one to curve two. And I think we're on the cusp right now. I think it's really interesting. Um, I've got one final question for you, except that it's actually two questions, but around the same topic. Um, your year out, what did you do and what was the most valuable thing you did that made you go, do you know what? I might not be going to, to make my down the entrepreneurial route now, but it's coming and this is how it's going to be. What was it that defined that year for you? Um, okay. Uh, so the, what, did, what did I do? Well, first of all, um, I was very, I'd, I'd left uh, Gallagher and um, had some ideas about what I was going to do. Um, but was quite frustrated about not being in a work environment. I kind of, I enjoy putting, a, putting on a suit and going into the city and I enjoy that kind of stuff. Um, so uh, the first few weeks, I, I think I painted the barn. Uh, that took a few weeks. Um, and we then uh, decided to take a long break away from the UK. So we went, um, Karen, my wife we went, and I, we went down to Latin America for three months and we traveled around Latin America. Because there aren't, you aren't going to get many opportunities in life to do that. You know, most people will take two weeks off. Three weeks is a real stretch. But to go somewhere for three months and, you know, we had, we had quite, a, quite a plan about what we were going to do while we were there. But uh, that was pretty good. And then the rest of the time we really was preparation for, for this business. Although I didn't always know it was going to be PIB. So I, I, I worked as an advisor with a couple of uh, private equity businesses. Um, uh, I worked on a couple of uh, acquisition uh, acquisition opportunities in those businesses. 
and, and then gradually the plan began to emerge. Um, Chris Giles, who's my good friend, and I'd worked with Chris before, um, Chris was very helpful uh, in that, and then we both jointly invested in in PIB. So that was a, a you know a big moment for us. Yeah. So um, yeah, a lot of the time was just spent either uh, having a long break, which is good because when you, if you travel somewhere else for three months, you don't really think about the irritations at home, and then the rest of it was just planning and preparing for this and getting ready for it. I think that's amazing. Travel's my um, driver. So I, I want to travel more. I traveled a lot in my teens and twenties and then life took over and kids came and mortgages and businesses. And I, I, I'm hoping to get to the, the fifties and, and do a lot of traveling. That's my plan. Well, yeah. I've, I've been lucky or unlucky depending on your perspective. Cause I, I think in my life I've had something like 21 months of garden leave. So we have, and it's, it's all happened in the last 10 years. So we have been able to take long breaks and go to India and, Africa and Latin America and stuff like that. We've been very lucky. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Well, um, on that note, I really appreciate your time. I think it's been uh, quite a lot of fun interviewing you and I've made some notes of things that I need to go away and think about now. So much appreciated. Uh, thanks for your time.